All right, so I'm going to have these guys largely and lady largely introduce themselves. Um, we're going to give them each just a few minutes to tell you a little bit about you know, their company and what it is that they do and all of that. So it seems a little silly for me to take a couple of minutes to say that and then them to take a couple of minutes to say that. So we're just going to go sort of sequentially down the line. I think one of them has a slide, but only one, right? Do you have a slide, if I understand right? All right, great. So we're going to start here, and we'll go down from here. My name is Davide Vigano, and I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called The Sensoria, and it's uh, a company based in Seattle, uh, Washington. Uh, what we do is we inject sensing technology into garments, sports apparel, and footwear. And the vision of the company is that the, the Garmin itself can become the next wearable computer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Negar, and uh, I am deep learning research scientist of Sense Aura Tech Company. And uh, what we are doing is we are measuring emotion from physiological signals and basically multimodal sensors. And we are device agnostic and already have different dashboards and different developers can use predicted emotions and we are actually an AI based company. Hi, my name is Henry Bolton. Uh, our company is the Focus Band. Uh, it's, it's a motion based brain training system, so it's EEG neurofeedback. Um, what's sort of, that's sort of what sets us apart. You're able to use it while you're in, while you're in motion uh, during sport. Uh, business, mindfulness, and sleep. Uh, so we just released a yoga app, which we'll, I'll run through later on in this session. Okay. All right, cool. So what we wanted to do was have a panel, basically, where we looked at cool integrations of technology, you know, actual practical applied different kind of stuff. Uh, so if you think about clothing, that's very different than Either this watch that I have, it's about a month old from Shenzhen, China, that's the first watch that does blood pressure uh, throughout the day. Very accurately, by the way, I have a clinical setup in the lab, and it's as good as the clinical setup in the lab. It's just sitting on my wrist, right? Or Jawbone, which may or may not be around uh, soon, we'll see, but uh, you know, also has heart rate tracking and all of that. These are very sort of different than socks you know, that track things in different ways. And they're also not nearly as helpful, frankly, as, for example, his yoga product, which actually helps someone understand, really, whether or not they're getting the most benefit that they can out of doing yoga. So you open up an app, and you follow along with someone doing their yoga saunas, and you have EEG on, and he has extraordinarily, you know, the secret sauce, I think, in many ways, is the, uh, is the detection and the elimination of artifacts, of motion artifacts, and things like that, right? In addition to uh, detecting whether you're in the right space brain-wise, uh, there's a lot of people that, can do, that do a lot of different stuff with are you in the right space brain-wise, but getting rid of those artifacts, that's tricky. Uh, another thing you saw Tim Mullen do as well. And so then in the middle, and it's very appropriate that you sat in the middle because we didn't actually stage where you were going to sit, but you really are in the middle, is data analytics, essentially, that glue all of this together. And so we wanted to have a, a solid representative uh, from that data analytics piece. Because earlier this year, I was at CES. And at CES, one thing was really clear, and that is that there were hardware people and there were analytics people. And they really weren't talking to themselves, uh, talking to each other very much. They just weren't crossing the aisle very much. And the hardware people would look at the analytics stuff and say, oh, that stuff is also expensive and complicated, and you know, what are we going to do with that? And the analytics people would be like, the hardware people won't talk to us. Why don't you make your own hardware or whatever? What? Are you kidding me? That costs a fortune. That's a nightmare. Who would ever make their own hardware? And so you have these sort of different camps, right? So we thought, let's bring people together who are doing this in different ways with very different technologies, some traditional brain sensing type stuff, but pushed kind of to the limit some socks and pressure sensors and socks and all of that, right? And then a company that's gluing these different pieces together. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, what I'd actually like you to do, if you can, I know a couple of you have products that you brought with you. So I'd just like you, if you could, to just sort of hold up and give people, we'll start um, with you and then we'll go to Henry after that and, and actually give people a feel for, you know, what do the socks look like? Where are the leads? What are the, where are the sensors? What kinds of sensors are on there? That type of thing. 
We're glad to do it. I mean, if you're at this, con at this conference, you probably are thinking about incubating or creating something. And it's very early. This industry is very early. But Jeff, you and I woke up this morning, and we probably did the same thing, right? We, we took a shower, and we put our clothes on. The consumer appetite to wear plastic and steel is limited to the wrist. And we communicate with the way we pick our garments and apparel, right? The, what, what are we wearing today, right? Wouldn't it be cool, even from a medical device perspective, not just from a pure consumer perspective, to remove the stigma of wearing a medical device by actually injecting, sensing, and making wearable technology transparent to the human eye? It is up to us. That, I mean, it's the geeks. It's us <laughs> that need to inject ourselves into the human behavior. We need to stop thinking about changing human behavior. I mean, UCSD and others have now, we have conclusive research that says, you know, a small fraction of people are really truly willing to change behavior for a long time. It's not just type two diabetics, right? It's all of us. So how do we, <laughs> how do we make it super easy to just get the data and unfortunately, knock on wood, each consumer becomes a patient from time to time, right? Wouldn't it be nice? to get to a doctor at some point that knows what the data means. And that's where the data aspect actually comes from. But so let me, let me break it down into a, an architectural diagram for you. There is non-traditional sensing that needs to happen. And we totally underestimated the challenge. We went to MIT, we went to Cornell five years ago. We said, give us your textile sensors. Turn out they don't have some. You know, they don't have, I mean, they truly don't have them. I mean, they, 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 they wrote and published papers on these things. And, I'm looking at Henry because he knows very well what I'm talking about too. But one thing is to say that tech, something is, from a research perspective, feasible in theory. One thing is actually to cross the chasm, of course, and make it washable, and make that sensor behave not like a two-year-old, right? Which, you know, it's hard to write firmware, and I see people nodding, <laughs> or, or software for something that behaves like my two-year-old used to behave, right? So we had to go back to the drawing board and create a freaking sensor, which I'm sorry, but it was just a nightmare, right? It was, complete ni <laughs> it was completely unexpected. It was not planned for, we did not have funding for it. And, and we are three pathetic software guys coming from Microsoft now creating sensors, right? Not exactly our you know, domain knowledge area, right? Turns out that it can be done. Eight months later, we were able to create these pressure sensors that you see in our socks. They're washable. They're a fraction of a millimeter thick. Yes, they are. Uh, and they collect pressure data from a plantar area of a foot. Now, this has triggered the imagination, of course, of sensor companies. We just won the ID Tech X award, uh, which, again, is pretty pathetic, right? If, uh, the, <laughs> the textile industry is a $3.8 trillion industry. After food and energy, there is textile and apparel because we all need to wear something, most of us, not all of us, but most, most of us, right? <laughs> so, so why not inject? For the record, at the conference, you do have to wear something. <laughs> For the conference, yes, but you know, after the conference or before the conference, you can, you're free to do whatever you want. So, so the, the cool thing is now the sensor companies have interest in building better sensors. So we're very willing to replace our own pathetic sensors with something that is more refined, basically created by people that know what they're doing just to be clear, right? Uh, that's the first layer of the architecture. N let's call it non-traditional sensing. The second layer of the architecture is you need some type of hardware platform, which is non-mission specific. What I mean with that is for the SOC or for Henry's products, every single person in this room has to create some type of electronics that connects to these non-traditional sensors and drives the data to the cloud in one way, shape, or form. Most of us are doing it via Bluetooth to a phone. In the future, we will have SIM cards or virtual eSIM cards embedded into the electronics. It's a lot of work. Creating flexible boards that can go to a so connect magnetically to a SOC, it's another crazy, wild thing that only crazy people do, right? You, you, there are a few crazy people here, I'm sure, right? So you can do it, but it's really, really hard, right? So being former Microsoft guys, we're trying to abstract everything we're learning and come out with something that is non-mission specific, and we refer to that as Sensoria Core. That is our super small microelectronics, which is six times smaller than what you see on that SOC, and we'll announce at CS this year. Um, and then the third layer of the architecture is the cloud, because before actually having people making sense of the data and turning data into gate 
from a sock, because once you have pressured data from a sock, that, that brings you nothing, right? <laughs> right? Now, now you have to, what does that mean, right? So now we have research institutions coming to us saying, oh, what do you mean? You, you have extended my gate lab outside the lab, and we go, what's gate? Right, because we didn't, know, we didn't know what gate was, right? So, <laughs> so, 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 turns out gate was actually invented as a science, the science of human locomotion, by the Germans and the Italians in the mid 1600s. But there is no real life tool to collect data from a from a human foot in real life. So think about Parkinson's, think about multiple sclerosis, think about adherence to meds, think about Alzheimer and geolocation of patients. Think it's not just running, right? So we cannot do everything, so we have created an SDK, and I'd love to actually share that SDK with any of you that want to actually, that, that is crazy enough to do it, <laughs> because there's still a lot of work to do <laughs> to actually make sense of this data, and because it's new data sets, right? Unlike heart rate or heart rate variability, which we get from the t-shirt, and we kind of know what to do with that, gait is a completely unexplored area, and Leonardo da Vinci used to say the human foot is a masterpiece of art and engineering because so many moving parts and, and it works so extremely well until it, until it breaks, right? When it breaks, it's a, it's a disaster. It's really hard to, to fix a human foot, unfortunately for us. Lots All of right, ligaments. So. So. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is that there's a lot of incredibly new data sources out there. A lot of this stuff has just never been looked at before. There's so much novel space here that's just coming out with things like these pressure sensors and whatnot. Henry, let me ask you. So uh, when I found your product for the, which I have to admit, I didn't put together into Yoga Brain. I thought yogabra.in. What is this guy doing <laughs> with this? I was picturing some sort of yoga bra type apparel yeah, thing. I'm yeah, like, we'll put him in the apparel no thing. Left. But of course, yeah. it's brain, yoga brain, right? Yes. It was brilliant, really, because this is, there are so few integrations that you can use with heart rate even, much less with EEG, right? And a lot of people have issues with the artifacting and stuff, but you literally have a, a hat, or I, I assume you'd use a band. The pictures for the yoga were the band. Uh -huh. um, and then you have people actually going through their yoga poses. And is John Cowan here? Is any, anywhere in the room? You, okay, so John Cowan's one of our exhibitors here. He'll be on a panel tomorrow. He's a foundational guy in the, e, in the EEG space. And he worked with golfers a long time ago. And I remember one of the things that he was telling me about all the athletes and stuff that he worked with, uh, including the golfers, were that you were basically trying to get them to turn their brain off before they swung the golf club, right? Or before they swung the tennis racket or whatever else. That at a certain point, you just had to shut off something that could be measured pretty easily in the prefrontal cortex up here in the front part of your brain. And then, you know, all those years of muscle memory and talent basically took over and you, you got out of your way. So you're kind of allowing normal people to be trained in that way across a wide range of sports and even yoga. And I thought that was just amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the, the focus band is, a, we have it in two forms. Uh, it's in a headband. Uh, we have fabric sensors as well. So we went through a lot of headaches as well, <laughs> going, uh, trying to make a, a cloth sensor. Uh, and it's made out of silver oxide, so it's flexible, um, which meant we could fit it inside inside a cap as well. So the ele electronics can just fit straight inside the cap as well. Uh, we found that uh, golfers especially didn't like wearing the headband <laughs> as much. <laughs> yeah, so it works for, the, like for yoga and uh, any exercise sort of uh, activities really well, the headband. Um, the, the big thing for us was uh, trying to prove that neurofeedback actually made a difference. Um, so all our stuff is, we measure the process the mental process against the result uh, in, in any sport. So we, we create these combines. Uh, so for golf, for instance, if they, if they get into the, we call it mushin, which is uh, a Japanese word, mind of no mind. If they get into mushin and they get uh, their eye control really well, how does that affect the result? Uh, like do they hold more putts? Do they hit more fairways? Um, for basketball, do they make more free throws? Um, so that's the sort of direction we went down. Um, we we saw sport was underutilized. There was no, there wasn't really any neurofeedback uh, that you could use while you're actually playing the sport. Um, it's okay to do it inside a in, inside the lab, but when you actually go out on the court, it's different. There's the pressure. There's people looking at you. Um, all the other players rushing at you. Uh, yeah, it makes a difference. So from going from sitting inside to actually wearing it out 
in, on the court or on the golf course or cycling or running. Um, that's what we set out to do, make it motion-based. Um, and that, Yeah, that's, that's what we did. Um, and the, the Yoga Brain app came about when I was actually doing uh, sun salutations, Surya Namaskar. I don't know if anyone does yoga in here. How many people <laughs> do yoga? Maybe just a few. I don't know if, how, does anyone not do yoga in here? You, <laughs> if you've ever done 108 <laughs> sun salutations, you'll know how hard it is to count. So you're, you're not really in a, in a flow state because you're trying to count. You get, <laughs> you're, you're constantly trying to remember where you're up to. So we added a count. We started off with a counter, and then we said, why don't we measure what's happening inside the head at the same time? So we can track your flow state uh, throughout each position. We can mark that against uh, a set, um, the, the set positions and then uh, against the reps. So at the end, you get a session report to show you how much green, how much flow you had um, and how much thinking you had as well. So usually you start off with a lot of red. So green is when you're in flow, red is when you're thinking too much. So it's a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat way to display uh, a yoga session at the end. Can I ask, yeah. you know, so... The thing that that brings to my mind is, just to dig in just a little bit, and then we'll get to you, I promise, um, is how can I be looking at my phone while I'm going through this? I mean, I'm already thinking, you know, Jesus, my foot in the right spot, right? Now I've got to, like, have my phone perfectly positioned for this, that, or the other thing. Is it, is it going to, are you going to stick phone the whole time? Is it, are you thinking of some haptic feedback at some so, point? So we you? have neurofeedback. So it's guided. We have guided pictures and guided audio. But then we have the neurofeedback. So when you're in the in the flow state, the music will turn on. Uh, so you you really don't need to look at the screen. You just listen to the audio cues, um, and then you listen to the audio feedback to know that you're in the ideal flow state. And you'll hear the music come in and out. Um, but at the end, at the end, you can see how much green you had and how much red you had. I've got to ask one more question. This one's for Mikey. Uh, are you doing anything with uh, groups and flow? And, you know, like, what if, what if a whole yoga studio of people have these things on their head, right? Is there we have got that. Uh, we've, we've got it running in beta in, on the cloud. So we have uh, group consciousness running now. Um, so you can have multiple groups together. Yeah, the idea is, obviously, for business, it's a really big, big market uh, for boardroom meetings uh, to get everyone into the, like we did this morning. As soon as everyone gets in the ideal flow state, uh, the dynamic changes in the room. Uh, uh, you'll find that people, usually when you go into a boardroom meeting, everyone has their own agenda, <laughs> so they're not really <laughs> listening to each other. So as soon as you change that frequency, get them back down into like the lower levels, theta and alpha, uh, the, the judgment goes away and people are open, uh, open to the conversation and you get a lot more done. That's what we found. Yep. Right on. All right, thanks. So Neger, the you're the glue essentially between a lot of this. Uh, you have the you guys have the processing uh, that can go from different devices, and be pushed out um, in different ways. We saw a little bit of that I think from Tim earlier. Tim's done a lot of work in that as well. He likes to think of I, don't, I was you know running around and coordinating things and everything, so I didn't get to see all of Tim's talk. But he likes to talk about uh, kind of end states. You know, that like a certain emotion is like an application that you just deliver to someone at a certain point. So, you know, and we go and we buy apps from the Apple Store or the Android Store or whatever right now, right? Um, but at some point, if you're a developer, you can just go ahead and say, okay, well, I'm going to plug in this type of focus or this type of emotionality or this type of arousal or not arousal or in very complex, very sophisticated ways and whatnot. Uh, and it's really companies like the one that you're working at that are instrumental in providing this architecture which is nascent and there's only a handful of you even out there at this point that have this sort of knowledge and capability. So can you tell us about that? Can you tell us what you add into products like these up here and also the other people that you've seen here and just whatever else is on your mind about this? Sure, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and actually, yeah, that was a really good introduction because uh, what we are using is like other people devices and we are using sensors, different kind of sensors. Our main expertise is on heart rate. So we are mostly trying to understand emo people emotions from physiological signals, specifically heart rate, because heart rate is 
easier to have access to. But we are also working with other sensors and other modalities. Uh, so starting from there, we are having a dashboard and we are having some output of people emotion in real time. Even we are like measuring em people emotion from faces with having a really noisy heart rate pattern from faces, you're able to understand about the emotion. And then we are providing a clean dashboard for developers and markets in order to integrate it to different kinds of markets, which are leveraging emotion with broader applications. Like for mindfulness, we have actually, we, had, we, uh, we did some experiments on mindfulness. So people were wearing different kinds of devices like this for measuring heart rate. And then we were monitoring how people are getting calmer or more, more positive during the mindfulness sessions. Or we also tried on gaming companies, like uh, gaming applications, when how people are engaging into a game or how the game quality or enjoyable moments are improving and also understanding about the flows in the game. So most of the time when there is a bug in a game, we can't expect gaming company to play in order to be like all kinds of possibilities in order to be able to understand about that a specific bug. But if we have signals which are like showing the emo emotion of people in time, we can say that, okay, go and check this, this checkpoints in order to be able to understand about the flows and bugs. And also we are uh, using it for monitoring uh, or giving some feedbacks from like, uh, from like managers can monitor their staffs or the employers and understanding how to improve their life or well-being. So we are actually, yeah, we are actually putting our dashboard there and SDK, we provide a comfortable SDK for people to use it or developers to integrate it in different parts of markets and yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think we need That's to awesome, thank you. Let's put the focus plan. Let's <laughs> connect it up. Let's connect it up. Yeah. Seeing your workload alleviate SP talks. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, great. Um, do any of you want to say anything else? If not, I'm going to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Do you want to ask each other anything? Is there anything that you want to add? I think you touched on an interesting subject when you said people are not looking at y their phone while they're doing a lot of things, not just yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, our focus you know, is running right now, so running is not a healthy thing to do to you know, look at your phone while you're running, right? So uh, exp leveraging uh, audio um, is, is, is a great user experience type of scenario that developers have not fully explored, I don't think. Um, there is a way to actually collect and connect artificial intelligence engines and turn data into actionable information via audio uh, we, we have developed a, an artificial intelligence coach, and we refer, in a friendly way, we refer to her as Mara. <laughs> it's our own Siri for running, uh, but it's very, very early stage. Um, and then, but, but in the future, I think with uh, smartwatches, but augmented reality glasses, we'll be able to consume a lot more actionable information in real time, right? Instead of waiting until tonight to look at the dashboard and learn that my back hurts, <laughs> which you know, I, I'd rather have the data and actual information that can help me stop doing the things that make my back hurts while I'm doing the wrong things, right? Increase my cadence, uh, move my foot landing from my heels to the forefoot. Uh, and that's where behavioral science can help us because we provide feedback in real time when I'm very much like with my, with my kids, right? So it's like, this is what you're not doing right. Or, you know, while they're doing. If I wait three hours or, or until tonight to uh, provide that feedback, <laughs> my right. chances to impact their behavior is very, very low, right? So Surprisingly, that, we're not that far from dogs, right? No. You have to immediately <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, so. yeah, we think we are. That's uh, why that's Pavlov right. uses them as experiments. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, once we start, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think when we start combining the technologies together, uh, so we've started combining a couple of technologies uh, already, so we're tracking the the process, the brain, but we we've, we've uh, integrated with Flightscope, which is a radar company which tracks the ball. Uh, so they do that for golf and 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 baseball, 
And yeah, when you c uh, start combining the technology together, I think that's when everything's going to be really powerful. Like uh, we've been talking already in the, in the green room about combining focus band with the, with the socks so that we're measuring the process while the person's running and then you can check if the gate's improving at the end. So that's the sort of way I see the technology going. I think there's enough good tech here already if we just start to pair them up together. I think that's where we're really going to take off. So basically in the green room, the three of you decided to merge together. Yes. That's just why I couldn't get you yeah. That's why we don't need those things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to warn the sound guys. I'm about to walk in front of the speakers. Um, if you have a question for any of these folks, go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, I'd like to get you into this conversation. All right, I'll start now. That's good, I don't have to go very far. Just, like, just quickly, the name of the companies each. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm f it's Focus Band. Focus Band. Yep. Uh -huh. Camp Aura. And Sensoria. Sensoria. Yeah, right, that's a little tricky there. <laughs> Sensoria and Sensoria. You can get it on the website. Okay, another, yep. Oh. All right, now I gotta exercise. I think there's a little bit for each of you, but uh, it, it, it speaks to now we're collecting so much data about uh, the body that include, you know, and this is an ongoing for everything in digital now because our digital exhaust is just becoming so encompassing. What do you see about user data and their ownership of that data? Uh, you know, because right now the business model is, is the private company sucks up your data and they, they basically take it from you and create certain, they, they, they lease it back to you. Um, do you envision, do you, do you have ideas around that? Do you see following the business tradition or are you thinking about other ways I can allow the user to own their own data? So that's a great question. Uh, uh, we're a small company, but we've made an early commitment to privacy uh, very early on. And uh, internally, people make fun of me uh, because I keep saying we sell socks, not data, right? So uh, <laughs> there is a way to monetize uh, different things without having to monetize the personal data. Uh, we think that the user owns the data in a real way, in a very real way. And as a user, I should be the one at the center of the system. Meaning if I decide to share the data with my trusted advisor, being my running coach, my physical therapist, my neurologist, my doctor, or even my employer, that, that should be up to me, and not Sensoria or another company or someone that we sell data to. So we anonymize the data immediately when we actually do our own uh, intelligence and research. And I can tell you it's fascinating right now because people are willing to share if you start building a relationship and connecting with them at the personal level. Um, so at the beginning, we, we, we started actually asking a lot of questions. And people don't, don't like to answer those questions. But if you start telling a person the impact forces that you're generating with this model of shoes is higher than this other model of shoes, please let me know what other models of shoes are you planning to use or you, are, you already have what we call the shoe closet. 45% of the people tell us which shoes they're using. So right now we're already able to tell a person which shoe is best for them and you know, this is data that Adidas or Nike told us. We don't have that data, right? So wow. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty exciting for us. That's really yeah. That's really negative. Something else to add? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, mm, yeah, that was a really great question. And um, when people are putting their data on the cloud, there is a really big concern that we, as companies, being able to use them in a way that the users may not be interested or like losing their privacy because emotion is really sensitive data. So we are actually, uh, in Sensoro, we are uh, trying to work and do research on differential privacy and work on uh, and making the data more like, I mean, having more research on this differential, differential privacy and being able to uh, not understand like which user created which kind of data at the, at the time. So yeah, it, it's a really, really good question. And I guess there should be too much research doing, going on on this domain. Thanks for asking this. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think as long as we keep it uh, general and uh, yeah, not personal, 
I think it's it's fine. Like to just get trends, uh, to find trends, I think is okay. But yeah, the person should individually own that data. All right, great. One more over there. All right. Thank you. I, I love hearing all uh, the work that you're doing. Um, just two thoughts. Um, one, uh, when you is there a risk that by simplifying information for people, we make them dumber? Um, in terms of uh, if people look at a weather channel uh, rather than looking at the weather themselves at times, there's advantages, disadvantages to both. Um, and I'm kind of wondering how, how you might think about that. The other thing is it's, it seems like the sensory input is where a lot of the focus is on uh, in, in the current field of technology. Um, I think the feedback systems have to be every bit as smart as a sensor systems. For example, with clothing, um, you're taking in the information in amazing ways, but wouldn't it be great to have the clothes speak back to the person? Um, already there's maps of emotions through the body, so you could send back uh, those places within the body where a person's emo emotionally receptive, so there can be a more of a reciprocal experience. Um, I'll, I'll start on that one. Uh, we, we had to do uh, when we first started the user interface, the, the avatar looked like a Christmas tree. There was that many things turning on and off. Uh, and for the user, it was just almost impossible to work out. So we really had to dumb it down and down and down to red and green. Uh, and th that seems to work the best. Uh, if someone wants those extra layers to come on, then they can just turn on the switches. But for 80, 90% of people, like one or two types of feedback is all they can handle at once. Uh, and what was the what was the second part of that? Uh, uh, same thing with the feedback. So we have we only have the feedback we have is uh, only two audio feedbacks coming back to the user. So um, uh, the brain state is one one tone, and then what the eyes are doing is one tone. When we had we had four or five different audio uh, tones coming back at the user, and you just couldn't work out what was happening. Yeah, so we keep it only one or two tones usually. If, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anybody else want to take a shot? Yeah, yeah I, I, I just wanted to, I, I think you're right. The, well, you need, w from a time perspective, you need to have an input in order to process an output, right? So before having sensor technology that can collect the data, it's really complicated to actually process and create intelligent way to provide not just data, but actionable information. And then from actionable information, we call it wisdom, right? The people don't even want actionable information. Uh, they just really want to really distill out the wisdom. What do I do next? And uh, I may not completely agree on your previous comment, which is, are you afraid to make people dumber by providing this type of information or feedback? I mean, if you watch the presidential debates, I don't think we can make any, you know, anyone, you know, it's just, it's not us or, you know, it's, <laughs> I think we can actually help people that really want to improve, improve um, or reduce the risk of injuries or recover faster from injuries. And we can either help the people that are wearing the product or their trusted advisors, so. One thing we did uh, find out is the learning modality is quite important. So some people, obviously visual, they like to watch what's happening on the screen. And then uh, most people, the audio is very good while you're, while you're in motion. But the, using the phone's vibration, that was when we added kinesthetic feedback, um, you could start to separate out things easier. So we've only done that in the last six months, added the vibration. Having those three forms of feedback um, allows the user to choose which one works best for them. Yeah. Okay, that's it. I'm sorry we can't take any more. I know it's awesome, but these guys will be floating around and for the most part have booths and out there where you can try stuff and whatnot the whole bit. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Round of applause. For this.